Um, I want to go over things. I want to give people an opportunity to carry me deeper on some of that stuff and whatever else is going on. And as I teased earlier, did our monthly newsletter last night, so we can go over some of that stuff. And I want to get your guys' feedback on uh, what we're planning on doing for the, the next edition of the Commodity Traders Almanac. Oh. Oh, wow. Get to actually drive content direction. We like that. <laughs> I'm calling it a focus group. Oh, um, okay. Let's see. Application window. How are we looking? We are looking good. Okay, and Johnny, you are all set, right, for the uh, videotape recorder? And uh, I think we're all set. So are you, you're, and you're all set too. Perfect. Except it's not February 223, by the way. What's that? It's not Friday, February 223. Is that a typo? Yeah, it might be. All right, so we've got a little surprise extra bonus. Uh, Jeff was here early this week. If you guys don't know who Jeff Hirsch is, he is the uh, publisher of Stock Traders Almanac. Pretty famous guy. Lucky to have his time. And uh, he's doing a uh, return visit and talking about uh, uh, calendar related things. Technicals. Technicals. He's going to be talking about technicals. All right. Let's take it off, Jeff. Go. Even though that's not a word in Microsoft Word. They don't like that one. Uh, don't you um, hate that? But uh, we know better than they do. Uh, seasonals as well. So uh, once again, thanks for uh, having me here. Thanks to Danny, Marlon, Johnny over there, who's been uh, making sure things happen. And uh, I turned off my email. So if something's crazy, I, I sent my text to uh, my cell phone to John and, and Danny, if you guys need to alert me to something. Um, so, who was here uh, on, on Tuesday? That's, that's on the in the in the group right now. Just someone to see if everyone kind of is there. So, um, I'm going to assume it was most everybody. There we go. Thank you. And um, so you guys know the story of my life. I was born a uh, in the almanac business and um, took it over from Yale in 2000 2001. Here's let me just over to the slides here whoops a little disclaimer from last time you guys know about informational purposes past performance not a guarantee and i don't know if to buy or sell anything etc so forth moving right along so uh we are now in the 51st edition of the stock traders almanac um i went uh through this a little bit earlier last uh, the other day but i was basically born into it um, Yale started it the, the year I was born. Um, he had been in a place called Indicator Digest, which I think is instructive. Uh, all right, Steve. A um, couple of people weren't there, so I, I will go through it a, a little bit just to um, update those that weren't there. And, you know, when he started back in Indicator Digest in 1961, he had come out of the songwriting business with my illustrious cousin, Sam Cosler, who I named my uh an iconic man so a giant as you can see um so we've been standing on his shoulders and and uh sam coslo who wrote my uh my old flame and cocktails for two and produced the movie copacabana is yale's older cousin my godfather yes jews have godfathers too and um because he was instrumental in bringing our family into the business as well as introducing parents and um I named my, my firstborn son, who's now in the seventh grade and has a little knack for charting. Um, and his little brother is also uh, quite a historian. So maybe there's a future. Maybe the legacy will continue. So we've all been standing on Yale's shoulders. He put um, market seasonality, cycles, trends, patterns on the Wall Street map. And, uh, you know, people were dabbling in it years ago. I always use the example of uh, the January effect, not to be confused with the January barometer, which um, is the, the tendency of small caps to outperform large caps in January versus the Yale's invention of the January barometer that as the S&P goes in January, so goes the year. 
uh, that was the effect was initially publicized in the 40s in a, a paper uh, in the Journal of Finance, I believe, by a gentleman named Sidney Wachtell um, back in the 40s. He was an investment banker. And there were some other people dabbling in seasonal cycles and patterns. But we put it all together. <coughs> Yale did in this handy, iconic reference manual. Yes, he was a visionary. Um, a lot of things in 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 front of people that um, uh, made it easier for everyone to follow the market's calendar and, and, and schedule along with their own. And um, we wouldn't be here for my whole life if if it if it wasn't uh, if it didn't resonate and it wasn't receptive, uh, you know, wasn't received well by by the trading community investors. Um, Yes, Danny, we will uh, try to get them going. But um, the other thing that I'm going to talk about later, I want, the Commodity Traders Almanac. Does, does anyone remember the Commodity Traders Almanac that we last put out with Johnny Person about five years ago? Um, it was the 2013 edition. Um, we are putting it together. So I'm going to give you guys a little opportunity. I'm going to just sort of tell you a little bit about what we're thinking of doing uh, for the probably the 2019 edition that will come out. And we be getting it out sometime around the middle of the year of the summer so moving right along i'm gonna have to switch back and forth between these programs here some of the um you know history of the books that we've had uh the first edition in 68 the current 2018 edition which is out there the almanac investor book uh that i put out in 06 that um was really a uh, culmination of all the things that we've been doing in the Almanacs for years. It was sort of an update of Yale's Don't Sell Stocks on Monday, 80s, which is a great title. Another great line he came up with that's the, you know, daily trading patterns, um, down Fridays, down Mondays, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and we also delved pretty deeply into the seasonal sector trends and ETFs at that point. The Superboom book, which I showed you that, um, strat that, that pattern last time. We'll look at that again quickly. I want you guys to Feel free to chime in with questions on that and a little book of stock market cycles and all the fun places we are privileged to appear on or get quoted in. And a um, couple of pictures for the past. There's the big guy and me back in 03, I think, at the old office in Old Japan. Um, the Dow 3420 t-shirt, which was the, the big super boom forecast Yale made back in 76 for the 500% move. And the Dow, which came true, him on Wall Street Week with a nice she mustache over there on the couch with is that tap yellow over there i think frank um let's see which one that is uh back in the 80s early 80s and um just a reminder of the offer we have out there i think i'm just going to post up the um uh the, the link to go here at stocksfordersalmanac.com this is i'm going to show you some of the things we we put out yesterday with the newsletter and um we have a special offer for you guys. Codes got an MTS 18 at the end there, the one year, the two year. You can see that. You can email me for the code or I'll send you the slides. Uh, I guess you could email, you can go to stocktradersalmanac.com and send us an email. Or um, I can put my email in there if you like. It's jeff.hirsch at hirschorg.com. There you go. And, um, so let's, uh, yeah, thanks, Johnny. Let's look at uh, some of the things we talked about yesterday. Our philosophy, for those of you that weren't here, a takeoff of the Santiana quote that those who fail to remember the past are condemned to repeat it. We believe that those who study market history are bound to profit from it. I know you guys agree with that. I can see the kind of work that you guys do in your trading analysis. But, you know, history is a guide, not a gospel. It's our buddy Sam Stovall likes to remind us. And we saw that this year clearly um similar trading action early in the in the year uh january break and february weakness not quite exactly perfectly aligned with the you know the historical averages but um definitely close so we've been doing this for 50 years plus analyzing every trend imaginable publishing in the almanac annually updating weekly monthly and uh sometimes daily um Santa Claus rally is important, as Danny's pointing out there, especially um, this year. I think that has the one of the reasons that um, the title of this this um, uh, slideshow um, part of it is the midterm uh, January trifecta. 
uh, which I'll show you in a bit, which includes the Santa Claus rally and, and uh, how that impacts the midterm year positively. So we combine all these things to construct portfolios. Of course, our bias in cycles and seasonality and patterns, current trends in the economy, monetary and government policy, which have been uh, interesting um, and driving trades and the market with uh, interest rate action, as well as some of the rhetoric, rhetoric that's coming out of the um, both ends of Pennsylvania Avenue. We look at internals and sentiment. Um, sentiment came down quite quite uh, dramatically recently and internals took a turn as well. Advanced decline lines and um, highs and lows. And I'll show you how we, we track that in our pulse of the market. And of course, fundamentals and technicals, big, big part of what we do. And I, I love the argument of, you know, between technicians and fundamentalists and trend followers. I just think it's ridiculous to limit your, your um, resources to, to one or discipline or another. And I like to combine them uh, to improve our returns and um, executions. So I'm just going back and forth. So the major cycles, war and peace in the secular bull and bear markets, that's the super boom forecast, the four year cycle, midterm year is what we're in. The seasonal cycles, the bread and butter, the best six months, not just sell a May and go away. Uh, and all the sector and commodity seasonal trading patterns. Um, look a little bit at quarterly and some of the monthly stuff. Weekly, daily, and intraday trading patterns are found um, in the back of the, the Stock Traders Almanac. I'm not going to delve too deeply in that, but I want to bring you guys' uh, attention to page 139 and 140 of the, all, of the Stock Traders Almanac 2018 so that you can um, – See how these intraday trading patterns persist with that 2 230 low and the rally that it closed despite all of the uh, high frequency and algo trading and, uh, and that human nature continues to drive out of the patterns of the market. And of course, the January indicators, the barometer, the Santa Claus rally, the first five days. We'll look at that. So back in, in um, 2011, we put out this super boom forecast and I want to make sure that uh, you guys are feel free to chime in and ask some questions about this if you have them, hopefully, or not, uh, if it's that clear. So back in um, 2011, we, we really formalized uh, our recognition of this pattern that Yale, Yale discovered back in in uh, 76 for a 500% move off of the March 09 low. And we uh, somewhat presciently um, Using history as, a, as our guide and, and, you know, standing on the shoulders of giants, put the words next super boom 2017 on page 36 of the 2011 Stock Traders Almanac after making this initial forecast in May of 2010 in the newsletter and then put it in the book. So let's look at the, um, the zoomed in uh, version of that chart. This was the um, chart that Yale uh, put together that we've redrawn from uh, the 76 period. He did several articles in, in, in uh, 76, um, reflecting on the action after the 74 low, which you'll see here in the middle gray area. And, you know, that was after Nam was over, Saigon had fallen and yeah, there was some um, stressful or, or uh, uh, at least tumultuous social things going on in the, in the country and the world. But Market-wise, it was very reminiscent of um, action after previous wars and, and secular bear markets. You can see we've highlighted the World War I uh, period, World War II, and the Vietnam uh, era bear market, and highlighting particular dates where things you know, triggered the cycle, not just some sort of arbitrary time frame of 18 years or 16 years or 17 and a half years or 20 years or whatever. Kind of like how I, I don't agree with the arbitrary 20% level for a bear market. I think there's um, much better definition there from, from our friends at Ned Davis Research. So what Yale noticed back in 76 was that following wartime inflation, you can see the CPI going up in the pink line at the bottom during World War One and World War Two, the market going sideways. And after inflation levels off and the war ends, you've got this 500% uh, move. Uh, after both of those, and he forecasted 34.20 back in 76. And after we hit that 82 bottom, and I, I, I just, you know, there's a debate that goes, that's been going on since the bottom in 09 that the secular bull market 
here. Yes, the bull market was here, but secular move doesn't really um, end until uh, or begin until later down the line after the, the ultimate low. So just like 1982, we think we had the beginning of the secular bull market in February of 2016 with that little uh, Ned Davis bear, I'll call it. Uh, so that was sort of our 1982 moment. And I believe that over the long uh, run, we're off to the races. We'll probably get another bear market um, at some point. It's usually in the cards, perhaps even a recession. Again, these things do happen. Uh, I'm not suspecting that this year, but let's look um, at a little projection that we've done. I updated this a little bit. I left in the, the February uh, low on the 8th and then yesterday's close. Uh, just to show you some of the action that occurred. It's a little more uh, uh, greater amplitude, but similar to the pattern that we, we played out. So back when I put the book out, Super Boom book, we um, drew a line uh, projection where the market might trade based upon all the historical patterns, uh, presidential cycles, secular cyclical bears and seasonal patterns. And I sort of traced out this blue line with using Dow closes. Uh, obviously, we broke away from that initially. The black line is the actual Dow monthly close. We tracked it pretty closely, but then we had QE one through three and operations twist and all that kind of stuff that raised the floor. And I don't suspect we'll return to any of those crazy Harry Dent levels out there who uh, him and Hassett and, and um, Glassman, I took the task in the Super Boom book uh, that there were numbers are way off and were never accurate or right. But um, I do not expect this midterm correction to be this steep. Uh, I think we'll probably get something more in the, you know, 10 to 15 cent correction phase, maybe the mid October period, maybe less. I don't suspect we'll hit full bear market territory, but you no, know, we could do a 13% drop over uh, 145 calendar days, peak the trough and get a Ned Davis bear. That wouldn't be so um, out of the question. And then I think we'll be um, heading back to, uh, you know, into the super boom pattern of going up 500%. There might be some further dips, another bear market or something uh, over these years. So this isn't a forecast per se. It's just a projection of how we're going to actually get to 38,820. So I just want to pause for a second, see if there's anything that anyone wanted to query me on that. If not, I'll just keep rolling. Any prediction on S&P year-end? Oh, yes. We have a um, forecast that uh, we put out in December of 2017, uh, like we do every year. I can sort of skip through some of this and, and get there for you, Danny. But this is what we were thinking back in 2016 uh, for 2017. We're a little conservative. Uh, we got more of the best case scenario, even though uh, we didn't get as much success out of the White House. I've got a few big things with the tax reform at the end of the year and the trimming of regulations. And we did get an accelerating economy and we did get, you know, 20% uh, gains uh, on the Dow, not quite as much in the S&P. So I would say we weren't too far off for that year for 2017. Um, a look at the four year cycle is just, you know, as I get myself into answering Danny's question for our, our forecast for, for 2018. So you can see we're in the midterm year, usually not that great. Uh, Pre-election years are normally where we get, you know, the pump priming, had the first loss uh, in the Dow since 39 in 2015. And um, we'll look at the alignments, Republican president, Congress 14.1. Market does even better with a Democratic president and a Republican Congress, up about 16. And um, so, corporate markets, please, less regulations. We're expecting um, continuing gains under this political alignment of congressional uh, Republicans and um, Republican of the White House. Uh, midterm elections are normally not good, and I think we have the potential for. Um, some serious mud slinging as we already have a lot of heated rhetoric in the uh, political arena. But uh, if we do get that sell off, that sets us up for this, uh, you know, bottom picking paradise that we often get in midterm years, which occurs mostly in Q2 and Q3. 
you can see highlighted in orange the week two quarter combination of the midterm year and then the real sweet spot uh, Q4 uh, midterm year to first two quarters of pre-election year. A three quarter combo averages about 20% for the Dow, um, 21 for the S&P and 32 for NASDAQ. So if we do get that correction, it is um, a nice opportunity for buying usually. Uh, midterm uh, low, you don't normally get, uh, that is Q4 this year, porcupine, correct. Um, so looking at that, that low, we tend to get a 50% gain. It's actually about 48.6% now. Uh, and highlighting low points on the left side, um, January seems to be a large cluster. I know we didn't get the, a low in January with this little correction here, but it was kind of started there and pretty close. The other uh, cluster is in October. Um, a lot of other months in there, too. You can see my birthday in 1970. I was four there. Um, but if we do get that pullback, you can look for um, a nice uh, trade. You see the highs for the election year really concentrated in December and on the last trading day of the year, which I find very interesting. So this is updated for you. Um, I added uh, current year 2018 to show you how we were tracking with midterm years after a positive post-election year, which was a question that came around the gains in, in um, 2017 that it was going to take away for uh, – any gains for 2018. That hasn't been the case historically. You can see the pattern very similar with all midterm years since 49 versus the ones that were following a positive post-election year. Uh, maybe a little more of a rally early on and a slightly steeper pullback, but only, you know, in the four, five, six, seven percent range at, at best. Um, so not something that we're, we're overly concerned with. You can see the Volatility that we had here in January coming way up above the trend. We'll, we'll look at that in a second and then back through it. And now sort of back into the, you know, more uh, historically normal levels uh, of midterm years around this time. Um, and you can see history rhyming here and not repeating exactly where you have this, this uh, January break, which I know you guys have traded for years in the pits. And it happened a little bit later, and it went a little bit longer, but um, again, more amplitude with, with one year, but kind of on time. And I think that's reassuring for me and for seasonal patterns that, you know, we had a big gain in January. February is that, um, you know, month, that weak link in the best six months. And, you know, as we told everyone, I think it's on the, the headline of our uh, um February outlook came out in January. If you go to stocktradersalmanac.com, I can show it to you, but not necessary. Our uh, January 25th, February almanac, big Janu January gains, correct or consolidate in February. Well, that's what we had. Um, I know it was a little painful for a lot of people, but uh, to me, it just means seasonality is working and things are in play. And I think we can resume this rally uh, at least, you know, into March and April before we have that um, worst six months. Uh, <clears throat> Republicans are definitely likely to lose seats, Danny. That's that's par for the course. Um, that issue is on. I don't have that in this slideshow, but in your Andy Stock Traders Almanac, if you look, I think it's right around the November election time. Uh, you have page 100 of the 2018 midterm election time, I'm usually bullish, um, despite the typical seat loss by the party. So um, just because they lose seats doesn't necessarily mean that the market's not going to do well. The market may actually um, like having some uh, change in there uh, if they're not happy with the way things are going. But let's move along here. Here's the forecast for 2018, Dan, that you asked about. Gave a worst case scenario, 5% chance of a full blown bear caused by North Korea actually setting off a nuke. I don't mean to be cynical here, but um, 
you know, we had a lot of a lot of scares, a lot of missiles, a lot of rockets, a lot of things set off by North Korea, and the market have right through all that. Might behave a little bit differently with the you know inflation fears and the the accelerated rate increase fears out there, but uh, you know unless we get some you know some no no impact from the tax reform or some other doomsday scenario, I don't see uh, a full blown midterm bear market. Uh, about 50% chance of average midterm gains ranging in the 8 to 15% above average, excuse me, uh, and a mild worth six months correction, pullback. But best case, if everything pans out, tax reform really juices earnings and CapEx and bonuses and paychecks growing, the economy keeps growing. That puts Dow 29,000 and S&P 3,300, there's the number you were asking about, and NASDAQ. 9,800 in play. Not that that's definitely what we're getting, but if everything goes well, that's going to be uh, the upside um, and uh, the potential upside. So let's look at some of the rationale behind that. Again, referencing our handy trusty uh, almanac. This is back on pages 131 for those of you following along at home or want to check it out later. Uh, 131, 132. Where you can see that um, the average move uh, of a bull market since 1900 in the Dow is 85 and 6 percent, 81.5 for the S&P over here on the right side, going back to 30, 1930 when we had solid S&P data, and back to 71 for the Nasdaq, it's 129.7 percent. Um, so looking at the low in um, February 2016, which is an official Ned Davis research defined bear market. They put it out there. I confirmed it with them, just like the little bear we had in 2011, uh, where we had a sizable decline uh, in the Dow over that, you know, 145 calendar days or more peak trough. So simple math, 15,660 on the Dow times 1.856 gets you about 29,000. Uh, same thing with the S&P, 1829 times 1.87815 gets you 3,300. And NASDAQ, which has uh, been performing best since the correction, at least as of uh, past day or so, um, up to 9,800 with 129% average gain. That's not to say we're going to get all of it, but we're already on the way to, to a whole bunch of it. So um, gains beget gains, and uh, we've had some positive <clears throat> uh, January um, indicators, as Danny mentioned earlier, the Santa Claus rally came in positive. That is the last five days of the year, last five trading days, and the first two trading days of the new year. The songwriter and my father uh, came up with the wonderful title on page 112, I think, or 114, or what is it, 116? I forget exactly which page it is. Uh, 114. If Santa Claus should fail to call Bears may come to broader wall. And what we saw in years like 2000, 2008, um, or even 94 and 04, we had some flat years and some really nasty declines in the gen some uh, a after a no Santa Claus rally. So there's an average gain of about 1.5%, 1.3% on that five day trading period. And when it doesn't show up, it's, uh, it's a negative. So the January trifecta standing on Yale's shoulders once again combines the first five-day early warning system, the first five trading days of January, plus the January barometer. And what we've highlighted here is the three years where we had um, a loss in the last 11 months or a really weak return in 66, again, the year that the Almanac started and the year I began, uh, was Vietnam related, we were cranking up troop levels and bombing Hanoi and 87 was the systemic, uh, you know, event that we had for the crash. And then 2011, our, it was our uh, debt got downgraded and we had that, uh, you know, government shutdown era, but that was a great buy in October of 2011. So I did a little creative Drawing on this one, this is the January uh, trifecta in midterm years on the chart. Purple line is 2018. 
red line is all trifecta midterm years. Look at that gain up to 21% uh, or so. And um, all midterm years in the blue line and all years to give you a little, you know, benchmark of, of uh, how all years played out. And I do love these, these one year seasonal pattern charts. And just for full disclosure, I laid out the midterm years that are in this um, sort of post it right here. And I want to point it out because it's just, not a usually statistically significant amount that I would rely on, but it highlights how rare it is to have a positive January trifecta in a midterm year. Um, February being off, this is as of the 22nd yesterday, not uncommon after this kind of bullishness. We had a week one in 54, a couple losses back here, um, but you can see the Average gains are pretty solid with only one losing year. The A4 mentioned 66 with the Vietnam issues and up four, down one. Again, only five um, instances, but still rare occurrence. Uh, and I think that's significant um, for midterm years to have this positive trifecta. And we had the December closing low and um, the years highlighted here are the years that had a positive January trifecta, um, and we had a, a a close below the December closing low. And this is an old indicator that if the Dow closes below its December closing low in the first quarter, watch out. Again, it's a little bit late in the in the year for me to make to, for for it to be that great of indication, but we do we do layer it in there, and you know the January barometer is proven more effective and looking at these things there's there's um two of these years there was no change and so far we didn't go any lower than the february 8th when we crossed the december closing low uh so that's a good sign for that potentially being the low for the year no guarantees on that uh we could rally up above the the highs and correct another 10 percent and still um hold that that low on, on february 8th but again um at uh, um, you know one possible negative wrinkle, even though uh, the trifecta supports it um, a little bit more than. So this is something I updated in the newsletter. Um, I'm not going to go jump over there if I don't have to, but uh, when we wrote our outlook last night. Um, I included an update to this this uptrend chart, and you can see that. Um, after the election, we had a little bit of a rally, and then I take uh, just the, the trend line from sort of after that rally levels off of somewhere around mid-December, maybe the 15th or so, whatever that is, and just stretch it out to the end of uh, December, where you can see the, the S&P traded in this channel um, quite, uh, um, you know, tight, uh, stayed in there, and then we get into January, we blow right above this this up the, the um, upper end of the, of the uptrend and came back to earth with those, you know, inverse uh, volatility exchange traded products run that we had and came right back down through the lower end of it and bounced so uh, firmly right off the 200 day moving average. And the thing that was also significant down here in the bottom is the VIX. You can see that the VIX was lower on that intraday low of, that was what Friday the 9th, I think, uh, than it was, um, excuse me, that's Friday the 9th and February the 8th, lower than it was when we first blasted, you know, down into the, the beginning of the correction there. Um, so we're struggling to, to find that support here. I don't know if you can see that green dotted pivot point support level, the monthly pivot point support and the pink line to 50 day. So we're looking at some pretty significant levels that supports obviously becoming a little resistance just like the 50 day. And I think we're hearing that today or at least so far. Um, and I think once we get through those levels, that'll be constructive for the market. Let's zoom in on that a little bit. And another hat tip to Johnny person who I um, didn't get to see in Florida, nor did I get to see Danny, but uh, we did chat and he, he learned me on this W123 swing bottom uh which you know may have occurred maybe occurring it's, it's a level to look for um it's even better on the on the e-minis um 
because you get the 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 uh, if you look down at the lower right here the 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 one and the three the of the of the W and I'm assuming you guys know what a W one two three bottom is right? Can I get a hell yeah or something out there? W one two three swing bottom, Bueller. So no, yes, <laughs> Danny knows it. So it's just, and there's also, the, it's the flip side of the, the M123 top. It's just a little technical trade. And um, it's, it's a level here. So you see, I've, I've drawn this line across the intraday high on Wednesday. That's the two, the middle of the W. It goes, there's a W like that. And if you clear that level, that's a green light. I haven't quite cleared it yet. And if you, when you do clear it, it then becomes sort of a stop area is that correct danny am i getting that right you'll let me know yes okay and then over here in the e-minis and it's it's better from my understanding if it's if the three second bottom of the w is a little bit higher than the the uh one the one there which we get over here in the eight minis but not so much in the cash index and you can see that too and right on the 50-day average and we're struggling with that today i don't know where we say okay. uh got the about 100 Dow points. So I, we're still struggling to get through that, but I think that's an important level technically. And that's one of the things we're looking at right here. So this is updated. Our, this is what we put out in the newsletter um, yesterday. It's a very, uh, uh, I guess, fun or at least uh, um, relieving or cathartic way to look at the market. It's sort of uh, a little you know, bulleted type of analysis. But we're looking at the um, market using the closes of the day before because all posts keep moving. But uh, bullish sentiment really came down. Uh, we like investors' intelligence. Um, we cheated below 50%. There's still a lot of correction advisors. So people are still looking for a correction. I guess the one thing that, that scares me in the back of my head is that there are so few bears out there. And, you know, often the market does what the least amount of people are expecting. So, um, it looks like we've got our wall of worry, though, that we can climb. Uh, fundamentals are firm. <clears throat> We're, um, we don't see a recession, uh, you know, lo looming or anything right now. I know Dalio says we'll get one by 2020. Okay, that, that's great. I'll take a look out two years. I don't think that that's unreasonable, but perhaps uh, maybe in the uh, next um, midterm election. Technicals are mixed. We went mixed. We went from really oversold, as I showed you on that chart, uh, down to, to more reasonable levels. And we're looking at that 50-day area where that pivot point is, um, the pivot point support. Um, and we'll look at some of the internals in, in, in a bit. Uh, let's see. Somebody chimed in over here. <laughs> it's like uh, Dalio. It's like the Goldman Sachs indicator. If they're they're always like selling the opposite of the book. If they're if they're saying uh, you know oil's going down, they're buying. You know they're looking for a, an entry level. So um, monetary policy. You know everyone's all freaked out about a couple of uh, tips. Um, you know we went from 288 to 295 of the 10 year, and and the world's over. Uh, and we'll get an extra quarter point hike. You know that's going to change everything. We're still at such historically low levels. It's just um, Amazing to me how how much that can spook the market. But you know, 10% correction, yeah, it came a little faster than it than it normally does. But still, not that big of a um, not that big of a pullback in the in the scheme of things and long awaited. Um, so we're still looking for um, you know the Fed to do the right thing. And I, I do think there's going to be a difference with Powell. I'm um, I'm under the impression that he's not as into the transparency, and I think that may um, keep the market guessing a little bit more. Seasonally bullish, uh, March is better in midterm years. Um, and it's uh, a little bit better for the um, Russell and NASDAQ. But March has some issues. <laughs> Steve, very funny. Um, pulse of the market, as I promised. Another thing right out of the back of the almanac. If anyone's got one, flip back to pages 180. 
85 and 86. And I've taken this, this is, you know, a real lesson in keeping score of the market. You can do whatever indicators you want. These are the ones that we've been tracking and, and we've been putting it out, sort of filling in the chart um, for uh, subscribers and for ourselves. So weekly data, and I think you get a natural smoothing by using the weekly data. And uh, I, I always refer to that weekly put call and barons. I'm not super thrilled with them knocking a half hour of the data out of the print edition of barons, but it's still online. So we're looking at the change for the week. We've got some highlights here. Um, this is that down Friday, down Monday indicator. We track another Yale in, when um, conditions are, are uh, difficult. Traders will sell on Friday, and then when they don't get better over the weekend, they'll sell on Monday as well. Sometimes we that ends up being a, a culmination in a bottom and a turnaround Tuesday, which is out there. But um, and just to, to be sure, you realize it's not just Monday; it's it's the first trading day of the week, or not just Friday; it's the last trading day of the week, which is pretty much a Friday. We've got uh, highlighting the S and P and the Nasdaq, tracking some of the losses along with the Dow. You can see the breadth that we're looking at um, just sort of fell off with uh, almost a 10 to 1 decliners uh, on that um, illustrious week we had. And then new highs and new lows flipped with a massive amount of new lows. And, um, you know, the, the rates over here ticking up just a little bit, but uh, it's the 30 years just still below the, the was it December 16th high of, of three, 316. So, Yes, rates are moving up, but it's just not that oppressive as far as I can tell, even though it's got the market spooked. But the market needed to get spooked. It was way ahead of itself. And here's a little um, tidbit we added. This one I put up on the blog yesterday as well as uh, in the newsletter. Um, you know, we are in February, the weak link, um, the worst six months and the best six months. And we've seen some weakness end of the month here and we're coming into that right now uh this is the fourth to last trading day today we've got some decent strength and if you look uh on in, a, in the almanac you'll see um i guess it's page at page 27 you can see down on friday end of february miserable and then if you look on the next page on 29, you can see a bear icon right there on the last trading day, which is this action over here on the right side. Um, not a great record. So just a trading option. The day after the first day of March is pretty bullish. Dow's up 15 to the last 22. So here's a little short-term trade um, opportunity for you. Uh, if you're into, and then we got the, the Dow, the S&P, and the NASDAQ here, depending upon your pleasure. The March Almanac, just a, a, just a little reminder of how, how much better it does in midterm years. Uh, one of the reasons we think the rally, you know, could resume here, especially after this correction. Uh, pretty decent performance. Um, Russell 2000 uh, seems to be the outperformer there, uh, even though um, it's not been around as long. Question. Thank you, Rob Kane. How do you think the market would react if the DC Mueller stuff turns on the Democrats and the GOP and the GOP actually gain seats in the midterm? I would think positively is my first blush. Um, I think it's not likely that this stuff turns on the Democrats. Um, I just think it's going to muddle along, and, and uh, if nothing comes of it, it'll go away. I think there is some risk. For the, the the White House and the GOP, uh, but again, it, nothing's come up so far. You got a couple of um, bad characters doing the same stuff they've been doing for years. Uh, so far, none of it stuck to Trump, and um, it may very well be fake news, Danny. Uh, market doesn't seem to give much of a hoot about it right now. I'm not sure if it would be uh, any better or worse if it turned the one way or the other. I mean, if if we start get looking at a, a, an impeachment or something like that, then um, that could be difficult. But if you, I, I did a comparison a while back, and I, I wouldn't be able to find it just quickly, of the um, Watergate. I think it's on the blog. Um, 
Watergate versus uh, the Clinton Lewinsky scandal uh, laid out with Trump. Maybe that's something I'll update um, for the blog uh, next week. And uh, um, it really didn't show, it showed the market pretty much tr- like just rallied right through all the stuff. And it wasn't until, you know, Nixon started to look like he was on the way out that the market cracked there in, in uh, 74. Um, but we also had an oil embargo then too, and, and uh, more sensitive to that sort of stuff. Just making a note to update that for you guys. I'll see if I can find it later. So here's our strategy calendar for um, for March. Some of the things that we deliver to subscribers. And our happy bulls and our angry bears, those are days that the happy bull side where the S&P 500 has been up more than 60% of the time or 60% or more of the time uh, in the last 21 years. And the flip side of that, when we've got these bearish days um, where the S&P was up uh, less than 60 or down 40% of the time or more. So um, looking for some, some uh, frequency magnitude areas there. You can see... Um, Average gains for the shorter time for March, a triple witching week uh, notations there. Monday's uh, up pretty good. Triple witching day is down. The week after March, triple witching is um... – <laughs> yeah, we had somebody draw those. Isn't that the cow from, like, that uh, laughing cow cheese or something? I think is what it looks like. Anyway, the um, triple witching week's important here. You see the Ides of March, so – we always, you know, tongue in cheek joke that uh, unlike Caesar, Julius Caesar, it's wise for traders to heed the eyes of March. You see a lot of late March sell offs and Q1 kind of rough week after triple witching in March has is, is been um, difficult as well. Now 20 to the last 30. Uh, so, and we've got some weakness around um, Good Friday and Easter when it falls in March. Um, you know, and then the market tends to rally a little bit more in, in, the, in the beginning of April. So, again, look for, uh, you know, we like to say March comes in like a lion, out like a lamb. Well, it comes in like a bull and out like a bear for the market. So, uh, just uh, and also the top, the reminders of the different sector plays that are out there and all the different um, uh, economic releases that we have there. So, it's our strategy calendar. Getting, I wanted to get into the best and worst six months. What's what's my one more question? Do you work on end of the month rebalancing of equities versus fixed income? Seems important with bonds over the past few days. Uh, we work on end of the month, beginning of the month, and middle of the month stuff. Um, I I think what you're pointing out there is what creates that monthly seasonal um, cash flow issue. It used to be the last five days, uh, excuse me, the last day of the month and the first for the new month was that monthly five-day bulge that Yale discovered uh, back in the 70s um, when he was doing the almanac. And now it's it's something more along the lines of the Super 8. We've got, again, flip to the back of your trusty almanac to page 145. And you can see the change there where, you know, we've got the last two or three days of the year and the first two or three days, excuse me, of the month and the first two or three days of the month being strong as well as the middle of the month, which is a new wrinkle driven by those bi-monthly or, uh, you know, twice a week, 401k, IRA, payroll deductions that go in there. Uh, closes. This is all closing. I don't use opens. That's a, That's a futures thing. We're looking at Cash closing prices on all of these things. Monthly cash flows. Yeah, that's it, Danny. Um, so what's my time frame here? Am I going to wrap up in a few minutes? Because I want to get, I wanted to blow through some of this best and worst six month stuff since everyone knows that and get to some of the other things at the end. Keep going. <laughs> you flatterers. Um, so Best and worst six months. Here it is, the one-year seasonal pattern. Anyone that tries to refute it, I throw this at them. They go back to 1896. Now, um, where uh, it didn't really relate to the best and worst six months because we were an agrarian economy uh, of World War II when we had Eisenhower's military-industrial complex and now the service economy. So I break these this 
seasonal pattern out into a couple of different time frames just to see what's still working versus what when it didn't work. And you can see the red line, first half of the last century, uh, when farmers and 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 the like were buying seeds and f fertilizers and fuels and equipment and hiring people and pumping cash into the economy from May through harvest time, and we see more of a buy in May period in the red line. And then the black line is. Since 1950, you can go back to 49, which is the first uh, full four-year cycle since World War II. Um, and then also since 87, because I, I think, thankfully, the market changed uh, for the better after the 87 crash. And I think that was helpful in what we recently just went through with uh, circuit breakers. And, and, you know, even though it's a similar move with portfolio insurance versus inverse um, volatility ETFs. Um so we see the similar pattern from 88 through 2016, where we got kind of a flat down period from May through October. Um, you saw that pronounced a little bit more in the midterm year, where there was a bit more of a correction in there. And then, you know, the typical rally from October through January, a little January break, and then through the end of April and into May. So that's the basis for the um, seasonal pattern. This is what Yale invented in 1986, came out in the 87 Almanac, the best six-month switching strategy. The only proven black box system out there. Uh, David Aronson, uh, Baruch College, and Chartered Market Technician, which is now no longer the MTA, but the CMT Association. Um, he ran the numbers since 87 when he put out his book, Evidence-Based Technical Analysis, which was our best investment book of the year into the 2008 Stock Traders Almanac. Um, I'm just hearing the tone of the scene of you guys are asking questions over there. And he had tested using the scientific method uh, about 6,200 different black box systems, trading systems, and put them through the scientific method, which um, is disproving the null hypothesis, and basically did the same thing with the results of the best, best switching strategy since it came out in 87, and found that unlike any of the others, it was proven to be uh, to not be the result of trance and to have predictive power. And the average performance of the best six months since 1950, November to April, 7.1% versus a minor loss in the worst six months, made of October, but the power of compounding, a a hypothetical $10,000 investment gains $843,000, which is a loss of $116. Using our MACD timing indicator, um, 817.9 on the buy side, 1226.9 on the sell side. I'll show you that chart in a second. Increases the average returns to 8.9 in the best six months. Loss expands to 1.6 in the worst six months. And it nearly triples the results of that $10,000 that $10, investment to $2.5 million versus a loss of about $6,600. So, again, seasonals, technicals, combining a couple disciplines, and then if you start picking stocks around this time, it really juices the returns and fundamentals. Here's the um, updated MACD chart from Trade Navigator, which uh, I find helpful. Um, able to draw things on there and do your own, uh, um, your own work. I've highlighted the buy signals in October 2016, the sell signal in May of 2017, and the recent uh, buy signal came late in February because we were looking for confirmation across the three main indices, the Dow, the S&P, the NASDAQ, and also uh, corroboration between the buy side MACD and the sell side MACD. And we used a faster one because uh, Bottoms and, are, are more of a, an event and happen quickly, and tops are more of a process, happen longer, a topping process. So we want to have, give a little more time to get out at the top versus we want to get in a little bit faster. But this year we came in a bit late. Now we're up about 2.3%. We were negative for a little bit. You can see a similar chart as I showed before. Struggling going to break through that 50-day and the uh, previous pivot point support level, which is now kind of resistance. But we did get a positive crossover here in MACD back in the 16th. Uh, this was updated last night. So we're looking for a crossover here, positive crossover on the sell side to confirm the buy side. We may get that today. On the NASDAQ side, it goes, it goes eight months, all the way November to June. Um, this has been a great uh, trade using the Qs or whatever 
uh, option or strategy you want to use. Um, better results last year because we stayed in longer through June. We had a 17, um, roughly 17% gain. Uh, we missed that in about 11%, but now we're back up. This is something that, um, you know, people we use the service for. I know people will subscribe and just for those signals. Uh, so here's a look at our um, great worst six months versus market. Question came out again. We had such a great first six months last year that is that going to take away from the best six months? And is it going to take away from next year's gains? Uh, gains, we get gains. We don't see that here. We, we sort of ran all the different um, years that we had over a 5% gain in the worst six months, which is what the um, market did at, at the year to date on October 31st when the worst six months ended. On October 31st, then what the next best six months did, here as a whole did. Uh, I guess I forgot to update this little part here. Um, so far, this is this was in January. Uh, last year was up S and P sixteen point five four percent. I think just the cash index. But you can see all the years were up um, when we had uh, the worst six months up. Next year, this current year, which would be twenty eighteen, um, still pretty solid record, up seventy six percent of the time. Only down five. Had some rough years in eighty and in eighty nine. Um, 2014 was, was 2015 was down slightly, uh, for the S and P and 68 and 93 were, you know, in there as well. So again, average gain about 11 or 12%, um, for 2018 based upon the previous worst six months being great. So our strategy is, um, you know, we do sell some things in May. We don't go away though. We'll do uh, get into some shorts and some defensive plays. I'll put some stuff in some bond ETFs. As I said, we use MACD and other technical tools. Um, and you know the key to investing. Let's see. Starts a little small. Is your MACD mean reversion or trend? Uh, if it's trend, if if MACD short above. Long or buy if might be short blow. Let me go back to that for you. So the blue line is the eight-day exponential moving is the difference between the eight-day exponential moving average and the 17-day exponential moving average. The F, which is the MACD line, the pink line is the nine-day moving average of the difference. So I'm looking for a crossover of the MACD line through the, uh, um, through the signal line or a positive histogram is the same thing, but it's often better right here below the uh, zero line. And on the reverse side, a sell signal, which had we been using MACD at this time, we would have got a sell signal right here where the MACD line crosses below the signal line way above the zero line, and that's a pretty strong sell signal. But let's see, did that answer your question? Okay. Um, but MACD is really not supposed to be used in a vacuum by itself. It's being used for a reason. Like if you were looking to trade the January break and you got this crossover, that might be a signal for you uh, or for, for someone. So, okay. So the key for us is sort of a risk on risk off uh, in the, in the worst six months, you get rid of losers. The key to inv successful investing is sell your losers short and um, let your winners ride. So I'm not just going to sell stocks in May if they're up, I will trade out of the indices, you know, the, the spiders and diamonds and cubes. Uh, if we want, let's see. Um, and I'll give you a little story again from my buddy Johnny Person. Great trade he made. I think it was back in 2012 when we were doing the um, <clears throat> last uh, Commodity Traders Almanac for 2013. We were he was I was down there in Florida with him in April, March, April, and um, 
we were looking at, or he was looking at the Russell 2000 going up, the advanced decline line of the Russell going down, and he put on a um, vertical bull call spread on the TZA, the triple short small cap ETF. So he's taking a leveraged um, product and putting a, a leveraged trade on it. Uh, it was around 14 or so, but 16, 18 of the May expiration, uh, advanced decline line led the index down. The index broke down, and he covered it, you know, a few weeks later for about like an 88 or 80 some odd percent gain for that that trade. So, a way to combine um, option strategies with seasonal trades. So, I, uh, I, I fixed a typo on this. My good friend and subscriber, Richard Canfield, shows how successful he's been and how it uh, gives us a vote of support for using the best eight months switching strategy. He took back in 2015, he called up and he thanked us and he renewed. Uh, he took a million and a half dollars out of his retirement fund uh, on our October buy signal, uh, bought the queues, patiently waited for the sell signal in June of 2015. 7% gain, 170,000 months. Again, in June of 2017, he called me, did the same thing, October 2016. This time, a 17% return after our sell signal in June of, of uh, 2017, a 70% gain for a $340,000 profit. So he continues to subscribe and, and use the service properly, at least one of the proper ways, I believe. So what do we got? I just talk about the VIX here. Market's cruising along. Some sector seasonal trades. Um, here we are in January, February. We've got a natural gas long that I'll show you on the chart coming up. Uh, a little high tech trade. Utilities do better from March to October. I think that trade might set up pretty well too. We're not quite there yet. Bring that out in the newsletter probably in the next week or so. But you can see the bullish cluster of stocks of, of um, uh, Seasonal trades in the stock sectors right here in October, whole gamut, and a couple of short trades that um, are pretty uh, distinct. Um, I'm going to point out materials right here, and you see we do three different time frames so we can see if it's still relevant in the short term and over the medium term. We also look a little bit further, but we're just showing the current results here. We'll we'll look back 21 years, 34, depending upon how much data we have. Some of these sectors, the data is, doesn't go back as far as we'd like. But just to look at the material sector as an example, um, again, be big in the news these days with uh, what's going on with the tax cuts and hopefully some infrastructure work, but that remains to be seen. And um, you can see the um, um, infrastructure, um, excuse me, the, the material sector, pretty distinct, worst six months from May to October. Um, Again, October to May, again, similar January break to the, the broad market. But just using our sort of uh, similar comparison, and this is in, instead of being like I did for the best six months, instead of being long the best versus long the worst, we're talking about sector rotation, meaning going long the best months and short the worst months uh, versus buy and hold. So you get a 15% annualized gain versus 5.3 on the um, uh, buy and hold strategy. And that uh, uh, same $10,000 gains about 378,000 versus a loss of about versus a gain of about 40,000. So some pretty serious increase in, in gains using buying, using sector rotation of buy and hold. Another question: Given the current market conditions of all the annual season patterns, what's the best sector play for the next two months? Let's go to the tape. Here's a sector trade. Um, I think we got a real decent buy point here. This is the weekly pattern. This is the um, oil uh, stock index and the XLE in the black line, the spider, um, you know, Exxons and, and that sort of stuff. And we normally have a move, uh, a little low point in sort of December. And then again here in, in uh, January, February, and we had a little high here like we have back here and we set up really nicely for this trade so i think 
XLE and energy is a, a decent trade here short term. And that will also show up. Um, Copper's kind of kind of coming down. We had our buy back here in December. Uh, I'm not sure I'd be jumping into that just yet uh, again. But uh, you know, if you were on it back during the correction, it would have been a decent time to get back in. This is the JJC, the um, EN for the futures, uh, and COPEX is the stock index. So that's one of the trades we put out there. We also trade a couple of stocks here. Um, Southern Copper and Global Brass and Copper Holdings are two highly correlated uh, equities that, that track the copper seasonality very closely. I got something else for you there. Yeah, I hope you had a stop in there on beans. The beans is, is, a, is a tough trade for us. Um, I really look for the setup uh, being there. I, I have to go back and look at that, but um, I think you've got a, a setup right here uh, for natural gas and um, the, you know, the, the stocks and underlying here's a little short trade i've highlighted the whole thing from about february to june but the real quick trade in here as you're asking what the next couple of months is gas uh you know from february till about april uh and we got a nice sell-off right here a setup on these on these two here so i think tracking the seasonal trend as you see at the bottom with the current action there's a little sector trade for you right here in the next couple of months gold and silver on the short side as well presented nicely. Uh, the DZZ is what the triple short uh, gold. I think it's triple, not, not as opposed to double. Uh, we, it hit our buy limit uh, the other day of about five. Um, I'm not sure exactly where it is at the second, but if somebody wants to look it up, we can pop it out there. The, um, decent short on the, on the, on the, on gold, decent short short on gold setting up nicely. Uh, so this is updated from the other day. You can see we got stopped out of a few things. Um, the spider energy that I've mentioned before, uh, we sold out of these. Um, that got got hit during the the, the um, correction. I think it's set up there again. But you can see gold and silver short is uh, available, and uh, around five bucks it was added on, on Valentine's Day. Interesting how we added the gold short on the gold giving love holiday. Sort of ironic, I think. Um, so just a little bit on the stocks. And, uh, you know, we we make our bread and butter uh, using our seasonal overlay, um, getting into longs, you know, August, September, October, shorts around June, July, when the market starts to roll over. And here's where we combine seasonals, fundamentals, and technicals. Um, we got a pretty robust screen using the Zach's um, research wizard. We'll also drop it all into IBD's market Smith to check these charts. And we're looking for, you know, revenue growth and acceleration, earnings growth and acceleration, good valuations. Um, and we're looking for it in, in, you know, relation to what the rest of the market is doing. So not just by itself, but you know, relative to the S and P or if it's a particular sector, we'll look at it um, relative to that sector. But uh, all things being equal, one of the keys is um, ratings, brokerage firm ratings. So if we have two stocks that um, score similarly or almost the same with growth and acceleration of growth and earnings and revenue and valuations and similar market cap, we're going to take the one that has less brokerage following it, less firehouses following it. Uh, number one, we want to get it before they do. And... Um, it, it also shows us that uh, we've got something ahead of them. So we try to get into these things before the market does. And we also aren't competing with uh, the research from all the big wire houses. So, um, you know, somebody has got 20 uh, analysts following it and one of them has got, you know, three, four, five, we're going to go with one, three, four, five. It's going to give ourselves a little bit of edge by being into something that not everyone's recognized yet. And you can see some of the stocks out there. Like one of our favorites <clears throat> is Scott's miracle grow. I know they got a big hit recently, and that's the uh, the big cannabis trade. But it came onto our um, uh, our radar before we knew why. And one of the other things we do at the end, after we get pick the stocks fundamentally and you know, in the proper season when it gets set up, we'll just jump into the the you know old school technicals, looking at chart patterns and and support and resistance and moving averages for you know, buy limits and, and stops and stuff. Um, here's a look at the list we put out from um, 
last October, uh, hindsight being 2020, we should have bought them all that day, but we try to be prudent with, with buy limits. Um, we are in a bunch of these. Some of them did get stopped out during the sell-off. I still own a bunch of them. Um, so here's the updated list. You can see some of our free lunch stocks, which I'm not getting into. If you want to go look at this free lunch trade for, for next year, it's a decent trade for uh, sophisticated traders like yourself. Back on page um, 112, if memory serves, the Wall Street's only free lunch served before Christmas. Looking for <clears throat> stocks making new 52-week lows on um, the uh, – triple witching day before Christmas. So we had a few gains here. Some of them got these, these ones that are all dated 12, 16. Those were the, the, the stocks or the free lunch. But looking back further, you can see some of the winners we've held on to global brass and copper all links, a copper seasonal trade, December, 2014, uh, Southern copper down at the bottom, copper seasonal trade, December, 2015, letting that winner ride. And then back up the Scott's miracle Grow. We got into this on October, 2015. I own this one. It did, it did, I still own it. It did get stopped out. We'll probably look to get back into it. Newsletter. I still own it in my portfolio. I got it at about 80. I came in a little bit late to this, but we didn't know it was a big cannabis trade. And now everyone's talking about it and it's on everyone's radar. Yeah, they had a little um, outlook, uh, of, you know, earnings outlook weakness in their call. And that, that dropped the stock a little bit. But I still think it's estimate to our system finding a stock that's was accelerating in revenues and earnings, good valuation before we really knew why. And everyone was buying all the hydroponic stuff and the fertilizer for growing cannabis around the country. And that technique has achieved these results uh, since inception of this portfolio and this methodology back in July, 2001, where um, through the end of last year, up about 460% versus 200 for the Russell and 118 or so for the S&P. Um, you can see we've got some some years where there was some weakness. You know, we did whoops, we did pull back a little bit here in 08, 09. But when we when we move, we move. And you know, this is letting winners ride and letting losers short and picking stocks at the right season with proper fundamentals and good technical analysis. So that's kind of the end. I want to do one more thing with you guys if I can get your Input. So here's the code for the, the offer. Uh, um, if you guys want to jump in and take advantage of some of the new trades that we'll be coming out with, those seasonal trades that you guys seem to like, with, um, March seasonalities and and, uh, and then into April and May with some of the sectors and commodities. And all right, focus group time. Danny, um, do you, Use the Commodity Traders Almanac as much as the Stock Traders Almanac. Was that something that you found useful? And who else out there has has a Commodity Traders Almanac? You do. Um, so you know how it's it's 2013 edition was great. Uh, and <laughs> but would you buy a thousand today? <laughs> we, are, we are offering it. It's it's not ready yet. We're, we're considering not putting it in the sort of calendar format that. We have um, in the Stock Traders Almanac where, you know, what happens in, you, you turn the page and you got, here's everything, the January Almanac for everything that goes on in January. Because in the Stock Traders Almanac, we're looking at the stock market, you know, equities, uh, Al, S&P, NASDAQ, Russell. But in the Commodity Traders Almanac, up to $1,000, really? Yeah, we were tracking it. Maybe, maybe I should sell a few. <laughs> on e was it eBay, right? On Amazon. I wonder if I can sell my own. Sell your used ones. That's great. So what I'm wondering is if it would be better if we organized it by commodity. So that there would be like an index in the front, you know, January, it would say, you know, S&P 500 break, long, you know, natural gas, 